questionable. The $15,000 was not going to go to you, was not going to go to me, it was going to go to therapists to actually do the jobs uh, that uh, were necessary for Chance to learn. But the fact that the school district probably spent two or three times more than the $15,000 that we had proposed um, in order to fight a lawsuit, that shows where their priorities are. Uh, that's a real problem. You might recall my son Chance has Down syndrome, and he's the love of my life. He is the frat brother I've never had. During COVID, however, when he was forced into remote learning, it was cruel. Uh, he could not learn on remote learning. He needs to interact with people physically to learn. Uh, the school district would not help us. They would not open up the schools. They would not send tutors. They would not hire other people. They would give us no resources to bring somebody in. So he languished just because he's different than other people. This is not just cruel, it's discriminatory, and I find it downright racist. Uh, so I look for someone to help. Igor Rankin was that guy. Igor, thanks for taking on the case. I was thrilled uh, that, that you took it on. A lot of lawyers don't want to take on school districts when it comes to helping disabled kids get their education back. Why is that? Um, a lot of times I think that um, some lawyers are intimidated by taking on large institutions. Uh, frankly, I get a kick out of it. Um, the bigger the institution, the more... Um, uh, aroused I am uh, by taking them on. Uh, and the other thing is, there's just not many people who do this sort of law. Um, you know, I tell people I'm an education lawyer, and they're like, what the hell is that? You know, right. like, uh, you know, you're going to go in and sue someone for teaching your kid math improperly? Right. Um, that's not the way it works. You really have to figure out that much of being an education lawyer is about representing kids with special needs, who I think are the most vulnerable um, population in the United States, including your son. Oh, let me just say outright, one, I'm really grateful for you and Samantha Baker, who works with you, uh, just did a terrific job. We went through our first round. We lost our first round. Uh, you are not surprised by this because it's a difficult, long journey to do. But it seems, from my point of view, so remarkably clear that my son did not get any services. Being online was no school at all. All we wanted was those services back. We just wanted him to have an extra year in school or something to make him whole. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And I want to get into the details a bit. It really has to do with an IEP, an individualized education program that kids like mine have. And if you have a special needs kid or a kid with some learning disabilities or issues, you get these IEP. Um, and that, it seemed, was what the judge hanged everything on. Explain it to me. So every kid um, who has uh, disabilities that require specialized instruction uh, is supposed to get uh, one of these IEPs. And then the IEP is designed to uh, provide enough supports for the kids and interventions that it actually allows them to continue to make, uh, to develop in school. Now, Prior to COVID, I think uh, that your son's IEP was fine. He was actually moving forward, developing. But what happened when COVID started is, of course, the school shut down and uh, everybody went online. Now, we know that in general education kids have trouble learning online. Fine. Um, what we wanted, though, is for kids like Chance to at least have the option of still going to school and learning in, uh, in person because they learn absolutely nothing online. And if we take someone like Chance who has Down syndrome, he needs human interaction. Okay? Uh, we all need human interaction, but especially special needs kids. It is how he learns. He, he doesn't right. read. He doesn't write. He has serious speech impediments. He needs to work with people, and sometimes you need to physically work with him. And that interaction is where he finds growth. Some of the goals stated in his IEP is to be able to walk down hallways uh, unsupervised, to be able to interact with people this way or that way, to speak a certain way and enunciate these words. These are you know, remarkably simple things you, you expect from a toddler. Um, but for him, it's a real challenge. And talking to people on this flat screen, it was torture for him. And I, I think about this, and tell me if this is a, a bad analogy. We got angry when people who were made differently because of the color of their skin were denied their 
education. You know, sorry, you can't get through that door because of who you are. I didn't find that much different for kids like Chance. You are different by no fault of your own. This is who you are, and because of that, you don't get an education, even though the other kids can get an education. I don't, I don't see much difference with that. Well, that's the thing. Discrimination is discrimination. We represent kids who also have to deal with racial discrimination or gender discrimination and special needs kids as well. Um, anytime you have vulnerable populations, you have to go out of your way to actually assist those populations. And I believe that special needs kids are the most vulnerable of our populations. You take someone like Chance, where would he be without you as a loving father supporting him? Where would he be without actually showing up in school school every day and having people work with them directly, hands-on, practicing things. Well, we saw exactly where he was, right? You put him in front of a screen, you hope for the best, but he actually learned absolutely nothing for several months. The school knew this too, okay? Every school knew that if you put a severe needs kid in front of a TV screen or a computer screen and expect them to learn, they're not going to learn anything. And by the way, it wasn't, I want to make this so clear, it wasn't the spectacular teachers and paraprofessionals that work with Chance. Uh, man, they, they live and die for this stuff and they want to do their job. You know, they can't, they're, they're, they're stifled. It was with the administration. It was with the superintendent and this weakling school board. And what I found interesting is when we were in negotiations, we said, all right, fine. He needs help with speech. And our final and best offer, I can say it, I don't know if you can, mm -hmm. was ridiculous. We're like, just give us $15,000 to hire speech therapists to work with chance. They said no to this. No. And yet they hired an out-of-district private law firm to work this thing all the way through the system, all the way to an administrative law judge, which must have cost multiple mm -hmm. of that. Uh, I can only think they are scared that they don't want other people to file similar complaints. But that really goes to where their priorities are. Right, um, we offered fifteen thousand dollars. They came back with four, and they wouldn't budge from that. And remember, you know, this isn't a car accident. <laughs> this isn't. This is my wreck. This is my check. There's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The fifteen thousand dollars was not going to go to you. Was not going to go to me. It was going to go to therapists to actually do the jobs uh, that uh, were necessary for Chance to learn. But the fact that the school district probably spent two or three times more than the fifteen thousand dollars that we had proposed. Um, in order to fight a lawsuit, that shows where their priorities are. Uh, that's a real problem. It, it's clear. They don't care about chance, even though their website and their mission statement is about all children and serving all children. They're not serving him. In fact, they're spending so much money mm -hmm. to deny special needs kids their service. And I think about, um, I, I, I'm conflict friendly. You obviously are as yes. well. It doesn't intimidate me uh, to, to, to get into a, a fight. There are a lot of parents who don't feel that way. There are a lot of parents who have special needs kids or they themselves are English as a second language or can't speak English at all. I wonder what in the world they do with their special needs kid if, if there's no one there to fight for them and they don't understand this whole uh, IEP process. And I've got to tell you, I still don't understand it all. Look, most people are conflict averse. They don't want to sue anybody, period. They especially don't want to sue their teachers. Teachers are really nice right. people. Um, I was not a very nice person as a teacher, but that's why I'm a lawyer right now. <laughs> My wife is a teacher. She's a delightful person. Okay? But nobody wants to sue teachers. What I explain to people is you're not suing the teacher. You're suing a bean counter administrator. Okay? You're suing a superintendent who really is a politician. Okay. And the thing is that sometimes it's just necessary. The vast majority of kids do not need to sue anybody. The vast majority of special needs kids don't need to sue anybody. But if you've got a kid who just isn't learning and you've worked with the school and worked with the school and you're still not getting any kind of traction, sometimes this is just as a necessary evil. So let's take my case. It was plainly obvious to me what was going on, what he was failing at. We bring it up, uh, and it goes to an administrative law judge. It seemed like a very nice, compassionate woman. And it was a virtual thing, so they really couldn't even see Chance and get to, get to know him. And it all came down, again, to this ridiculous contract, this IEP, which in my mind is kind of like a... Uh, 
marriage prenup. If everything goes well, you really don't need to worry about this, but it's the guarantee of what the services you and the district have agreed to will be there for your kid and go, it's not being done here. We had, and tell me if I've got this wrong, there were 13 goals. And so on these 13 goals, um, you need to meet these goals. The district said we met five? Five. Five of those 13 goals. Five of those 13 goals. And while we didn't meet those other goals, the judge ruled, that's, that's enough for your kid. Yeah, that's, that's enough. Five out of 13, take it, and let's move on. Help me with this. It's hard for me to help you with this because it doesn't make much sense to me either. Imagine any other endeavor, short of baseball, in which you succeed five out of 13 times. Well, most of the time, we would have a special word for that. That word is failure. So it is obvious that uh, Chance was failing, not because of anything that he was doing, but because of the inadequacy of the services being provided to him. Nevertheless, uh, the court decided that five of 13 was sufficient. Now, on the other one, some of them have used this tagline, made progress. Yeah. Now, my son learns slowly, and sometimes he has bursts, and then it flatlines for a long time. But like all of us, we're all making progress learning things. Um, uh, he plays with a crayon. He's going to learn more motor skills there. But that's making progress. That's, that's, that's such a weird term, and apparently that's all it takes. Well, it's not enough because you have to make meaningful progress. And in some federal districts, that's what the standard is, is that a kid has to make meaningful progress. Um, here, it's kind of adequate progress in light of a kid's abilities. That's become kind of the national standard, and I'm not even sure what that means. The problem really is much larger than this. In Colorado, it is really challenging to win these lawsuits, and that is because it seems like institutions are behaving the way that institutions always behave, which is their primary job is to protect themselves. And when institutions are challenged by other institutions, then they kind of circle the wagons and protect themselves. I'm not interesting, in, interested in protecting any other institution. I'm interested in protecting kids. You're interested in protecting kids. And frankly, I think if you have a battle between a large institution and a special needs kid, a special needs kid then the benefit of the doubt needs to go to the kid. But the benefit of the doubt goes to the government. That's correct. All right. We are appealing this. Um, and where does it go next? So it goes to a federal district judge right now, and it's called what's known as a de novo review, which means that the judge takes a fresh look at everything. Now, that's great. It's great that we have this process. Uh, the problem is that it's slow. So in your case, in a typical uh, case with a special needs child, you can be in and out of court within 60 days. Congress was wise, incredibly, <laughs> to actually set it up that way. The problem is now a judge can look at it for six months, a year, a year and a half, two years. Well, kids are getting older. Kids change um, much more rapidly and much more frequently than adults do. So we don't know how long this review is going to last. Meanwhile, Chance is still not getting the makeup services that put him behind in the first place. It is, he will forever be injured by the year he missed Correct. of education. So there was a successful case in Colorado how long did that take to get resolved? I can't remember exactly, but I think it was six or seven years. Six or yes. seven years. And it went all the way up to? The Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court. Yes. This was a case in Douglas County, if I remember correctly, with an autistic kid who was denied his free and appropriate education. And uh, it took six years to win that case. In the meantime, those precious years of education are lost. That's the problem. The system has to move quicker for these kids. This is not some kind of an insurance dispute or a car wreck or a business dispute where money makes a person whole. Here, we're talking about a process that can start when a kid is six years old and then end when a kid is 12 or 13. 
you're looking at two entirely different people at that point. You may have different disabilities. You may have other trauma that has taken place. You may have education that wasn't effective for many years. But meanwhile, the courts are just grinding this out. There's got to be a faster way of getting relief for these kids. And that is what? What has to change? I mean, it, it just it, it is so heartbreaking that these the most vulnerable people in our country are being treated with such disregard and so cruelly. They they are the ones who are losing out of on all of this. The law has to change. The law is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It has to be structured uh, to assist special needs kids more, to be more deferential to special needs kids, and to make the process go faster. But remember, disabled kids don't have political action committees. They don't have lobbyists. Um, this is not on the minds of anyone uh, in American government to say we have to do more to protect our disabled kids. But again, you know, um, Dostoevsky once wrote that you judge the level of civilization by how it treats uh, the most downtrodden in its society. Well, again, special needs kids are the most vulnerable in our society. It says something about us if we are not having laws uh, that are effective enough in actually benefiting these kids. Let me switch this completely around, and I want to go back in time. And I, I want people who have special needs kids, whether it's a learning disability, simple dyslexia, whatever it is, to learn more about this IEP process. And that um, when it started for me with Chance, you sit around the, the table with the principal and the uh, teachers and the professional speech therapists, and we're all on the same team, and they all fall in love with the kid. And, and it, it's warm, and it's fuzzy. It's, it's not... It's not a conflict because you're, you're trying. And so you put your, your signature on basically whatever they, they throw at you, and, and not unreasonably so. But really what I learned is I should have done that very differently throughout this. Um, so what's the advice for parents who are going through this IEP, Individualized Education Program process? They are building basically a contract. And I think about it. The teachers do this day in and day out. The district does it thousands of times a year. Uh, they've got lawyers who have been through this. I only have one special needs kid. I've never been through this before. I have no expertise in this. You know, if I, if I, if I had my wits about, I, I would have found somebody like you and say, well, here's my guy, he's coming to the meetings. But that ruins the spirit of the meeting as well, but still, They've got all the advantage, and you're just the newbie. Two big pieces of advice, one general, one specific. In general, a healthy skepticism of the educational process is something that parents have to have. That doesn't mean that you're going to be rude or belligerent with your teachers or that you're constantly going to be hovering over them, but you got to take a look at your kid and say, is my kid advancing or is my kid not? And you got to go with your first instinct. If the kid isn't advancing, something is wrong, no matter what anyone else is telling you. The specific thing, under the law, once a year, every parent of a special needs child is entitled to ask for an independent educational evaluation. That is to have someone outside of the school uh, evaluate the kid academically, socially, emotionally, behaviorally, health-wise. Um, and the school at that point can either give you your independent educational evaluation and pay for it. So it costs nothing for parents, or they can file due process. In other words, they can sue you. They're not going to do that. Okay? They're just going to give you your independent educational evaluation. Use it, because then you're not just relying on what the school is telling you, hey, Johnny's doing great or Susie is doing great, but you're actually getting an outside evaluator that the school is paying for, who is genuinely independent, who's telling you, here's what's really going on with your kid. Take advantage of that. You tell me this now? Why didn't you tell me this 12 years ago? I didn't know you then, and now you've enriched my life so much. <laughs> so if I'm understanding this evaluator, it's an auditor. It is to get a third-party audit of what's really going on with your son, and is he making the progress? It seems to me also that I should have been much more precise about measurements of what these goals are. Um, yeah, and that the reporting, even if they say they made progress, 
they should document how much progress Correct. that was made. So we get a lot of this made. Well, he's, he's getting there on this, and he's doing this and this. Well, does that mean he, he, he moved from here to here or from here to here, but he just didn't quite meet our goal? Well, what schools are doing is something that you would never tolerate from someone else. Imagine that you hire a contractor to do your plumbing in the house, okay? And the contractor, you know, you come up to the contractor, how are you doing? Making progress, okay. How are you doing today? Making progress. Eventually, you're going to want to see how that progress is made. You're not just going to be content with someone saying, we're making progress. Well, that's the problem with these schools. They come out with these progress reports saying, hey, uh, your son, Chance, he's making all kinds of progress. Okay, great. Show me the data. I'd like to see the progress that he's making. If they can't do it, don't trust him when, they're, when you're being told that he's making progress. It's, it's really tough for parents because you're asking us to do two roles. One, be really supportive of, of the teachers. One, to be there and be partners with the teachers the, the way we think it ought to be, but you don't trust them. You trust is, the I, tr teachers, I do trust the teachers. But not the institution. Because to me, there is a world of difference between a teacher and even an assistant principal and then an upper level administrator. Because those are the bean counters. Those are the ones who are divorced from the kids and don't see the impact of their decisions. Those are the people that you have to be skeptical of. And none of them know my son. Exactly. None of them. I mean, I, I, I tried to ask the lawyer who they hired, I'm sure at pretty sizable expense, what would you do if this was your son? Mm -hmm. He wouldn't be working that case. You know, it's, it's, it's so remarkably hurtful and cruel. I, I started off with that, and maybe it's a good way to end it, which is these, these kids have done nothing wrong. They are who they are by, by no decision of their own. Um, and, and for the education system to say, mm, we don't want your kind here. Uh, we're not going to serve your kind. It, it's segregation. I see no other way to put it. It sucks. Um, you know, it, 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 I don't know how you have a system where you can justify underserving the kids who actually need the most and you give them the least. It's an unacceptable system. Um, and so many parents just don't know any better because they're not told any better. They rely on people that they don't know to have their best, best interests at heart. And oftentimes they do, but oftentimes they don't. And that's why that healthy skepticism is necessary. I want to thank you again for taking on the case. I want to thank Samantha, who did a, a great job. Uh, you guys poured your heart into it. And I know this is the first step of what could be a six-year-long battle. Um, uh, but I hope the message is to all school districts, we're, more and more parents are going to be fighting this because yeah. it's just unacceptable. We're people, not going to stop fighting. People want to get hold of you um, and might have questions or kids that are in trouble. Where do they go? Our website is Colorado Law Team. Dot com, and I can be emailed at Igor, I-G-O-R, at coloradolawteam.com. Why did you change your name to Igor? That is just the scariest thing. Well, I was born in Russia. Guys named <laughs> Igor, you know, grow on trees over there. <laughs> but here, you know, it, it's great. Even when I, when I was a teacher, they didn't even call me Mr. Rakin. They called me Igor. And when I was in charge of discipline um, with uh, DPS, yeah, Igor sounded much more intimidating. So I just went by so Igor. So it's your given name? Oh, it's my given name. Yeah. Does it translate to something? No. In Russian, it's uh, pronounced Igor. One more time. Igor. Igor. It comes from, my understanding is it comes from the Norse Ingvar. I watched Young Frankenstein, and I know it's pronounced Igor. Um, you know, I will consider just going by Igor right. from now on, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.